a group of Japanese baseball fans in a flurry of excitement because their team won a sporting event, a baseball game, unleash the curse of Colonel Sanders. And then travel back in time with me as I talk about my days as a journalist, student at a community college. And it's not all about proofreading and editing. No, this humble journalist was involved in not just one, but two real-life conspiracies. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day, too. Some really quick notes before we get started. Yesterday I had my Zari China Hole story. And I said Corpse Glitch recommended that. He did. Definitely did. But so did the real guy, the best guy. He recommended it as well, and I didn't have it on my notes. So I wanted to make sure I made that correction. The podcast itself has been corrected, but the YouTube videos just stay as it is. I can't correct that. But I want to make sure people get credit for what they recommend. And also, let me say very briefly, um, there won't be a Monday episode. This will be the last time there won't be a Monday episode. I'm still in Sacramento. Next week will be a short week. The week after that, we'll be back to normal. And that's it. That's all of our notes. We got a lot of stuff to cover today. So let's go ahead and get started. Yesterday, we talked about Colonel Sanders, the Colonel Sanders, king of Kentucky Fried Chicken. But I teased you. I tickled your little conspiracy bone, or paranormal bone in this case. It's all the same. It's just one bone located right beneath your elbow. I tickled it. I went, hee hee And you went, oh, stop it. And I told you that there was a curse related to this. So now we're going to talk about the curse of Colonel Sanders. Now, to put this in context, I think this is kind of a wide-known fact. Maybe not everyone knows it, but it feels like it's wide-known. Actually, it's actually, now that I think about it, it's probably quite obscure. In Japan, for Christmas, they eat Kentucky Fried Chicken. Back in, like, the 70s or the 60s or whatever, some marketing exec at Kentucky Fried Chicken said, they don't have turkeys in Japan, but they want to have a Western-style celebration. Let's, let's make KFC the celebration for Japan for Christmas. Or Thanksgiving, one of the two. Uh, They don't celebrate Thanksgiving, never mind. For Christmas, they're like, yay, I'm glad the Indians fed all those white people. They don't celebrate Thanksgiving over there. Christmas, Christmas. So they wanted to celebrate Christmas. And you know there's a conspiracy theory that after Jesus died and then came back to life, he went to Japan? I should cover that at some point. Because there's apparently all this evidence that Jesus was walking around Japan for a while. Like, long, long time ago. Like, three days after he flew up into the sky. So anyways, they celebrate Christmas with KFC to the point that that is like the day that most stores make all of their profit. People from like corporate KFC office have to go down to local KFCs and serve food because they're completely slammed. And you have to call in your order like weeks before. You're like, I want some big old box of chicken. What are they? The barrel of chicken. I want the big barrel of chicken and some gravy, please. And then you go down there, pick it up. It's super huge over there. KFC is huge during Christmas time. So they have a ton of KFCs, Kentucky Fried Chickens, in Japan. So that that's the setup. That's the setup for this story. I, 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 otherwise, you'd be like, why do these things exist? Why do these things exist? We're in Japan. We're in the city of Kansai. The year is 1985. And right now, the Hanshin Tigers baseball team, the Hanshin Tigers, they win the Japan Championship Series. Now, that particular year, they had an American player on their team, a white guy named Randy Bass. So Randy Bass is playing for the Hanshin Tigers that year. Now, there's a huge celebration. They have this huge celebration. They won the Japanese World Series, basically. They're having this huge celebration at a place called Ibusu Bridge. Ibisu? Ibisu Bridge. And they, they came up with this thing that people would yell out the name of a player, and someone who looked like that player would jump off the bridge into the canal. So they're like, so-and-so, and and some guy's like, hey, that looks like me. Ah, They go like, so-and-so, and and someone goes like, yeah, that looks like me. Ah, But then when they yelled, Randy Bass, everyone's like, ugh. There's no white people. It was all Japanese people there. Nobody looked like Randy Bass. But someone goes, hey, I know who looks like Randy Bass. I know who's white around here. And there was a statue of Colonel Sanders standing outside a KFC. And people went and they ripped the statue because in the KFC there they have it's so famous they have statues of Colonel Sanders outside their KFCs. They run, they grab the statue, they use their Herculean strength, break it off, throw it into the canal, 
yay, everyone cheers. Super, everyone's laughing. They thought it was a great idea. It was the only person within 100 miles who looked like Randy Bass. Well, I can't wait to do this again next year, the crowd said. The Hanshin Tigers for 18 years, losing streak. They were the last or next to last in the league. Twice, though, they won like their pennant. But even then, everyone's like, there's no way they're going to go any further than this. Like, this was a fluke. This was an absolute fluke. We are cursed by the curse of Colonel Sanders, our patron saint of Christmas. We threw him into the murky, murky river, and there he lies in the watery depths. We need to get him back. They were tried searching for this guy for two decades. Now, they knew where they threw him off at, but they couldn't find him in the water. And, and the people, the Hanshin Tiger fans, were f- convinced that this was the reason why their team was losing. They were cursed by Colonel Sanders. In 2009, in 2009, they're building a boardwalk in that area. And they find it. But it's cut in two pieces. And oddly enough, it's missing its glasses, which I don't know how the glasses would come. I don't really know how anything would break off a statue, especially the glasses. Although I imagine they were just like drawn on. But anyways... The statue's missing its glasses and its left hand. And since then, the Henshin Tigers still aren't doing exceptionally well, but people feel that the curse is close to getting lifted. If they can find that hand, they they say if they can find the hand, the curse will be lifted. The glasses are really, really a long shot. I find it weird that no one could find a statue in in the murky depths of the river. It's actually a canal. Is that the same thing? Is a canal man-made and a river is naturally formed? Anyways, I find it odd they couldn't find it. And people were really, really searching for this thing, sending in dive teams and stuff like that. Because after the fourth year of coming in last place, you would assume that you're cursed. The statue that has been removed from the canal is now in the KFC headquarters in Yokohama. And I love this quote. I love this quote. This is from an article I was reading about this. It is not viewable by the public. Only employees and special guests are permitted to gaze into the rescued colonel's eyes. It's definitely like a reverent figure over there. He would be the equivalent of a Santa Claus, except instead of bringing you a new bike, he brings you some buttermilk biscuits. I find sports curse... I don't watch sports at all. I used to watch NASCAR. I used to have more time, and I'd watch NASCAR. I've gone to basketball games and football games and stuff like that. I'm not a huge sports guy, but I find the idea of sports curses fascinating. And I find the idea of sports superstitions even more fascinating. Because really at the core, sports is, by its very nature, a competitive game. If every player has their own superstition and every fan has their own superstition, but you're you're competing against an other whole group of superstitions and, you know, things, rituals you have to do each day, it's basically the modern equivalent of, like, I don't want to say magical warfare, but like thought, psychological, or psychic warfare. Let's say you have 5,000 people on one side who want one thing, and 5,000 people on the other side that want another thing. It's not like everyone has their own agenda. You have teams and fans of those teams. The mental power pushing between those two things must be amazing. I wonder if anyone's ever tried taking like one of those like, I don't know, made-up devices, like uh, not an e-meter, but uh, like, well, those are made up too, but a... um like a psychotron white box facilitator or whatever, and measured the psychic energy between the two groups. I find it fascinating. I remember once I was at a basketball game, and <laughs> like I've been at maybe three basketball games in my life. And I remember a, a, a friend of mine who took me to the game had to explain to me the idea of home field advantage. And I was like, is it because like they know the terrain? And he's like, it's a basketball court, dude. The terrain is the same everywhere. Some aren't more hilly than others. He goes, no, it's because the fans are cheering for you when you make a point. But if you're at an opposing team's arena and you make a shot, people boo. You get the ball, people boo. And it decreases your energy as a player. Fascinating. Fascinating. And I didn't think about that. But yeah, I just find it fascinating that you basically have two sets of psychic energy pushing against each other and then just this ball bouncing in the middle of it and both sides wishing for the ball to go in a different area. I mean, that's the most basic explanation of sports but yeah sports curses sports superstitions i just find fascinating imagine coming in last or second to last for 18 years and then having to go play another baseball game the next day it's hilarious but that okay so we're done with that story we have wrapped up the colonel sanders duology and i want to talk to you it's friday fridays are kind of off the cuff a lot of the time we are leaving japan we are traveling back in time to the late 90s 
Sacramento, California. We got on our baggy pants. They're backwards. We're wearing our cross color shirt with a big African medallion chain. And we are walking. I didn't really dress like that. I didn't really dress like that. But we're dressing like that now because it's the late 1990s. And we are walking across the campus of American River College, a little community college tucked away in Sacramento. It's where I went for like seven years. I totally just like chilled there forever. I took tons of different classes, made lots of friends, hung out, got into, you know, get, getting into fights on weekends, coming back one day all bruised up. Teachers are like, what are you doing? But at the core of all of that party experience, because that's what the best thing really about college is hanging out. But at the core of all that was also my journalism class, which was my passion. And really this podcast is what I see as a continuation of that journalistic career. Because it's really about researching and then telling things to people, which is all news writing is. Okay, so that was a long-winded thing. And we'll see how much of that survives the editing process. But let's talk about my conspiracies that I ran into. So the first one I want to talk about was probably my second or third semester in the journalism class, writing for the American River Current, the newspaper there. This was old school. We didn't have Photoshop. We didn't have PageMaker. We had to lay everything out. We had to cut the articles out with a little exacto knife and lay it on a big board and then send it off to a printer. I was in in high school. We were type using typewriters. That's how old I am. So, anyways, I remember once I, I my my journalism instructor was Bruce Pat. He's a great guy, great person to learn from. Now, I remember once we we would get mail and CDs and stuff from people because we were a newspaper. So we got. Chumbawamba's first CD, and we're like, who are these guys? Never heard of them before. I don't know why that's notable. That's not a conspiracy. But one day we get a huge packet. It was just addressed to American River Current, so I got into it. And it was this, it was probably about 10 pages of handwritten notes with a couple of drawings on it. And it was just before you even read the first word, you looked at it and you thought, a madman wrote this. You could just tell by the way the handwriting was that a lunatic had written this. I don't know how, you, how you're able to do that, but I, you, there's just something about it. You go, a sane? This is not the ramblings of a sane person, and I haven't even seen the first letter on the page. And so what this document talked about, it was the story of a man who lived in a mental hospital pro- a couple blocks away from American River College. There was like a mental, it wasn't necessarily like a lockdown hospital, although I'm sure they had that facility. It was, a, it was on Auburn Boulevard. It's like an unmarked building Looks like an office park, but it's actually where they send people who are mentally disturbed. I had a friend of mine who went there. Her mom (laughs) sent her there, and she's like, Mom, I'm fine, but her mom was having trouble with her. Threw her in there for the weekend. That sucks. That's one thing that sucks about being a kid. So I get this letter, and it's this rambling diatribe. And he said, I have been put in that mental hospital. Now, (laughs) now, now, that's a great way to start off your letter. I was a former resident of a mental hospital, and this is what I saw. In th- I hope this conspiracy is not real, otherwise they're going to come after me. This is what I saw in this mental hospital. There's a two-ton crane on the top of the building. Why would a mental hospital need a two-ton crane? The two-ton crane shows up throughout his letter. We keep referring to the two-ton crane. And what he referenced, what he's talking about is, on the top of the building, there actually was installed a giant crane. That was used to lift stuff up to the roof. Now, whether or not it was a permanent fixture, whether or not it was there to lift up air conditioning units and then eventually the crane would disappear, who knows? Who knows? I'm sure you could go there today and see if the crane's still up there. Hey, yeah, I'm in Sacramento. I don't have a car. I'm going to be like, hey, mom, drive me by this mental hospital where we can find out whether or not this conspiracy is real. But he goes on to say, why would a hospital, why would a mental hospital need a two-ton crane? And he had the answer to it. He said that the crane was used to lift up giant barrels that would then be put into the air conditioning unit. And these barrels were full of a toxic substance he called cramp gas. And he said that he would be sitting in his, well, he wouldn't be sitting, he would be laying down in his bed at night. And he could hear the people in the other rooms screaming in pain. And he couldn't figure out what it was. And then he said that his legs started to cramp up immensely, like the worst possible Charlie horses you could get from your toes to your hips. And he begins just writhing in pain, flipping out. And he goes on to say that he believes it was a gas coming through the vents and causing his legs to seize up. This letter goes on and on and on. 
about how they're either testing this on the inmates that this is a weapon they're going to use. It's a way to break the spirit, not inmates, but it's a way to break the spirit of the people who are residing in the mental home. Could be a torture technique. He wasn't for sure. He went on and on, but he wasn't for sure. The only thing he was sure of, there was a two-ton crane on the building. Cramp gas was getting pumped into the building every night. And him and the others were suffering because of it. And he was sending this packet out to all local journalists so they could cover this story. Now, I I was already way into conspiracy theories before I got this letter. I remember when I got this letter, I was having a ball. I thought it was the greatest piece of mail I could have ever gotten that day. I was like, oh my god, a real life conspiracy? And it's literally like three blocks from here? Come on, guys, we gotta check it out. Hop in the mystery machine. And I remember just reading it and laughing so hard and thinking it was the greatest thing I'd ever read. And the journalism instructor, Bruce, came out and he's like, what's so funny, dude? And I was like, oh my god, I got this letter from this maniac down the street. I want to do a story on this. We've given a lot of free reign on the type of stories we covered. I said, you know, it's like within distance of the school, it's uh, interesting, and maybe it's true. And Bruce goes, listen, man, you're going to be a journalist, and that's cool. He's like, good luck with that, you loser. But no, he goes, you're training to be a journalist. He goes, one thing you're going to have to deal with is this stuff. He goes, you're going to get letters like this all the time. And you can. He goes, feel free to go investigate this thing. Feel free to go down to the mental health place and see if there's a crane on the roof and whatever. He goes, but, but, you're going to get letters like this all the time, and you have to make a decision whether or not you're going to be, quote unquote, that journalist. You're going to be the guy chasing down all the conspiracy theories. Now, I thought to myself, I, w- I want to be that journalist. I want to be the guy who's researching this stuff all the time. That would be awesome. And eventually, I did become that guy. And you're saying, yeah, Jason. So you wanted to do the story. You had the lead. It was only a couple blocks away. Did you go find out whether or not there was cramp gas in the building? No. No, I didn't. Because I was scared. I was too scared that the ramblings of a madman were actually true. I remember driving by the building. I, rem- I drove by the building all the time. I, rem- I remember discussing it with my friends about how we could infiltrate the building. Maybe one of them could turn me in. I'm glad we didn't go with that plan. Turn me in as a lunatic and I could go undercover. And I'm like, no, my legs were totally fine. I'm eating bananas the whole time. Like, totally fine. Like, no. I, but uh, see, and that's the thing. One of the things about doing this show is a lot of times like, I'll be looking into conspiracy theory. And in the back of my mind, I know it's not true. I just know logically that it's not true. I pretend that it's true while I'm researching it. So I can kind of look at every angle. And then when I present it, that's when I'll start saying, no, this isn't true. This is the reason why this stuff isn't true. But in the back, there's always that thought where I'm like, what if this is the one that's true? I've recorded episodes and released them and then got like worried afterwards. I mean, like, what if that's true? What if something happens now? And they're like, you shouldn't have talked about Mormon Bigfoot. You know what I mean? Like, I, every so often I'll record an episode, and it's always the weird ones, too. It's always the ones you wouldn't expect. I, don't get, I didn't get nervous about, like, golf. I was a little nervous with the Golf Rumors episode. But sometimes there's episodes that I'll record, and I'll be like, probably shouldn't have, said, probably shouldn't have talked about that. And so there is, a, there is a sense of, like, scariness and danger with these topics. Because... If it's true, I'm getting cramp gassed for the rest of my life. I'm getting thrown in a mental hospital. They're going to 5150 me, and every night I'm going to be like, where's my banana? Where's my banana? And all my legs cramp. Although, to be fair, I'd have a great ass. Like, if every night your just lower body cramped all night long, wouldn't they just work your muscles out? You would just be stronger when you ran away. You'd have great, great leg muscles. So that was one conspiracy that happened during my time at the American River Current. But there's another one that I was actively involved in. This one was a criminal conspiracy. Well, it was a crime that was covered up by the school district. And and it's so bizarre. And this one's going to blow your mind, guys. Because I can guarantee you that this is a problem at every single university in every single town. And it has been covered up for years. When I started American River College, when I was actually coming up with, I was thinking like intro to journalism. There was a group project And for Intro for Journalism, we all had to write an article about crime on campus. Some people talked about, like, break-ins, because we had a lot of break-ins at Sacramento. People talk about this, people talk about that. I was hanging out with these two other girls who were writing this article, and I happened to be going to the school library, and there was school police officers walking around, walking around the library. I had a friend who was a librarian, and I go, hey, what's up, Why 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 are these officers here? And she goes, oh... Dude, you just missed it, Jason. 
some guy was just jacking off upstairs and he like came all over the desk next to this girl and then he ran away. And I was like, first off, didn't miss that. Don't want to say that. I'm totally fine. Secondly, are you kidding me? And she's like, no, no, we have a problem here with that. I'm like, really? And at that point, the two officers come walking out of the, uh, they walked up and down the stairs. They're like, we lost them. We can't find them anywhere. And I was like, what? And she, and she's like, yeah, dude, I told you, man. And then she's like, shh, it's library. You're supposed to whisper. So I go, bingo, like, I have to write an article about crime on campus. I'm going to write an article about this guy jacking off in the library. But it wasn't a one-off thing. It wasn't a, it wasn't a one-shot thing. Apparently, through the course of my investigation, I found out that American River College had an ongoing issue with men masturbating in the library. Because the library was mostly like a library study hall, so you had these little cubby holes that you'd sit at. And a guy would see a cute girl, really didn't matter, any girl sitting down. He'd sit down next to her, open the book up, pretend like he's reading, but really be masturbating. And then sometimes he'd ejaculate on his book. That would be a good solution. Well, actually not doing it at all would be the best solution. But sometimes he would ejaculate on the woman, which is like 10 times grosser. And then he'd run away. The cops would get called. They'd check out the library. They could never find the guy. And that was that. But it wasn't one guy. It was at least six guys that semester doing it multiple times. And the school was keeping it under wraps. They were not making this known. That women were getting sexually assaulted at a library. There was never any warning, never any announcement that this was going on. And I remember thinking, oh, I know where the guy's hiding. Not because I'm him. But I'm saying, you got to get in the mind of a sicko. If you're a man who's masturbating in public... And the cops are looking for you. I remember the cops going, we checked every male restroom. There's no one there. And I go, because he's in the women's restroom. He's a pervert, dude. If you're a pervert, it's not going to be like if you're ejaculating on random strangers, you're not going to be like, oh, I have too much dignity to go in a women's restroom. If you know they're only checking the male restrooms, you go into the girls' restroom, and then just come on out. They had multiple people doing this over the course of one semester. And this had been going on for years. And as I'm investigating it, because I would have to, this was before Twitter, you'd have to walk up to people, ask them questions, call up people, had to have all these face-to-face meetings with people. I uncover that this is a common problem in every library. Almost every library has a problem with men ejaculating on women. I had a friend who went to UC Davis. His wife was a librarian. He said it's so common at UC Davis, they actually have terms for different jack-off people. Like, they'll be like, oh, we got a growler on level three, which means he makes noises while he's masturbating. Or we got, like, a sneak creep. He's the one who just, like, shoots through the bookcase. So, like, you're reading a book on one side and it comes over you. He says there's so many people who do it and there's so many different techniques. They have a security force. Their only job is to catch people with their dick out running around. And there's so many different types, not just different people, but different classes of people who do this. They have code words for them. It is such a common thing and nobody knows about it. I can almost guarantee if you go to your library or if you know someone at your local library, you ask them. Now, if you're living in the middle of Idaho, they may go, yeah, back in 08, someone jacked off on little Miss Susie. She was getting ready for the bake sale. But if you live in any place that has any sort of population, I'm sure they'll say like, yeah, once a month we have to chase somebody out. If not more. Because at AR, it was more than once a month. So I uncovered this big, it wasn't just the crime being committed, it's the fact that the the school was covering it up. The school was covering it up. I was not popular with the administration at the school because we ran a big, I still have that newspaper, have a big headline, sexual assaults on campus in the, the library. I don't remember the headline. It's, it's at home. I have the copy of the newspaper at home. But So my first byline as a college journalist, and it blew open this huge thing. The college was covering up sex crimes on campus. Absolutely amazing. And, and, and the, the school police stymied all of our investigations. We would ask for police reports, and they would li- it was like out of a movie. They would give us a police report, and every possible thing was blacked out. So it was basically just a report full of black lines. It had no information we could use off of it. I remember once, probably shouldn't tell this story, my editor at the newspaper was this girl named Heather. Now, Heather 
is, I haven't talked to her in probably 20 years, but at the time, she at least, this amazing woman who was super mean to me, she was absolutely beautiful. She was super mean to me. I used to make a lot of spelling errors, I'm really bad at spelling. And when I would tell, she was my editor, when I'd give her an article, she would then read to the entire newspaper staff my article and pronounce my spelling errors. And everyone would just laugh and laugh and laugh. And I'd be like, oh. <laughs> but it taught me to be a more careful speller. And we ended up becoming friends. We hung out and stuff like that. She invited, she asked me to drive her to pick up her car because it was the, at the mechanics. And I was like, yeah, sure. So I go over to her place and we're watching uh, Jim Carrey. Was that Ace Ventura 2? We're watching Ace Ventura 2. And... She, we just put it in. I can't, I used to hate Ace Ventura. I used to absolutely hate those movies. And I remember sitting there and I'm like, out of all the movies I got to watch with this girl, it's Ace Ventura too. Was not happy. She was really, she came from this really rich family. We're sitting in this really nice house. And we're sitting there and she gets a call and she goes, oh, the mechanic said my car's not going to be ready for tomorrow, so I don't need a ride. But do you just want to still hang out and watch Ace Ventura too? And I said, nope. And I just <laughs> laughed. Dude, I just got in my car and bounced, dude. As much as I enjoyed hanging out with her because she was a really cool kid, there was no way I was watching Ace Ventura 2. And I still haven't seen that movie. Anyways, so the reason why I'm saying that is because one time I got to leave a lot of details out of the story, but I came into possession into uh, in an area around an unre unredacted police report. Uh, regarding one of these incidents. I can't say how I got it or anything like that. I'm sure the statute of limitations is long far over because it was like 20 years ago, but still. I come into possession of an unredacted police report, which is still public record. I have my camera on me, and these are the old film cameras, these old Peter Parker cameras, and I know I can't leave with the report because it'll be noticed, but... I begin taking pictures of the report, and I'm like, this is gold. I have all this information. Parker, you're a genius. Click, click, click. And then I remove myself from the location of said report, which we did get later with details redacted. And I go to Heather, and I go, Heather, you won't believe it. I told her the story that I'm not going to tell you guys. I go, because I don't want to get in trouble. I go, and I got photos of the police report. On this camera, we finally can actually have some official explanation of what's going on. And Heather's like, really? And I was like, yes, on this camera. She's like, oh my God, Jason, that's so awesome. Here, give me the camera. And I go, okay. And I give her the camera. She <laughs> opens it up and pulls out the spool of film, exposing it to the light. And she goes, you're an idiot. And don't ever, ever do anything like that again. It's funny because she's totally right. The, the the police report is public record, but you still just can't go around taking photographs of a police report. Plus, someone have, would have asked, hey, where'd you get those photographs? She was much smarter than I was. Much, And she probably still is. She's still in journalism. Almost everyone from that American River College class is still in journalism in one form or another. One went to go on and be one of the first person who started uh, SACB.com. One of them's a huge uh, sports writer, true crime writer in Fresno, Stockton, one of them. And Heather runs some women's website somewhere, some women's journalist magazine website or something like that. And I am doing Dead Rabbit Radio. The reason why I wanted to talk about that is because I think it shows that conspiracy theories are all around us. All around us. We always look towards the Pizzagate or the 9-11. We look at the big stuff or the flat earth. But they're really all around us. And I find the ones that are down to earth the ones that are more compelling, I don't cover a lot of, I'm sure you guys have picked up on it, I don't cover a lot of global conspiracy theories on this show. I like the ones that happen in your backyard, in your library, in your classroom. Because not only are those the ones that we can prove whether or not they exist more easily, they're the ones that actually affect you more. If Hillary Clinton eats babies, that only affects her and the babies. As cruel as that sounds, and you could say, well, yeah, but dude, the power structure, the powers that be, I get that, I get that. But we don't know if any of that's true, and there'll really no way to prove it unless we see her pulling a bib out of her mouth. But the idea that your own local township can be corrupt, that your 
university could be covering up a crime that a mental health ward nearby could be pumping cramp gas into people. Those are not only more provable, whether or not they're true, they not only affect you more, but they're actually more terrifying. I could go on and on and on about Pizzagate all day long on this podcast. I don't, and none of you guys want to hear that, but I could do that. And the chances of Hillary Clinton's hintmen coming after me, taking me out, laying in front of my computer, two shots to the back of the head, incredibly small, incredibly small. But the chances of me uncovering a crime, proving a local rumor to be true, discovering that something is being hidden on purpose by not the powers that be, but your local authorities, those are the ones that can actually get you killed. Those are the ones that can actually get you disappeared. Because you're literally walking around your locale, talking to people, asking the wrong questions, and the people who you're investigating know you personally, or they will find out who you are very shortly. Now, obviously, I didn't get killed by the cramped gas industrial complex, and I did continue my career at American River College. Ended up becoming a became award-winning journalist, actually. Won a ton of awards for my work there. But... The conspiracy theories that are the mundane ones, the ones that fly under everybody's radar, but affect you directly, those are the ones that can actually get you disappeared. So when a lot of people ask me about researching conspiracy theories, looking into it themselves, I want to offer you encouragement, but a word of caution. Be careful where you tread. You step on the wrong tiger's tail, and you will get eaten. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at Jason O. Carpenter. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great weekend, guys. <laughs>